All right, so you ready to dive into some seriously fascinating stuff today? Always up for a good deep dive. What have you got for us? Well, we're digging into your research, and it's a big one. The 1997 Illinois UFO sighting. Oh, now that's a classic. It really is. This isn't just some blip on the radar. This is one of those cases that people are still talking about decades later. It really captures the imagination. Absolutely. And what we're going to unpack today, it's not just about what people say they saw in the sky over Illinois that year. It's how we even try to interpret these kinds of events, how these stories they get told and retold and what it says about our own, I don't know, maybe our own search for the unknown. Yeah. And you've got some interesting sources. Like we're going way back, right, to like news clippings and firsthand accounts. Oh, yeah. We're going deep into the archives for this one, trying to get as close as we can to what people were experiencing at the time. Perfect. So let's start there. Let's start with that night in St. Clair County, Illinois. We've got all these eyewitness accounts. And the thing that jumps out is just how consistent they are. You know, it's not a bunch of blurry photos, and I think I saw something. Right. It's not like these fleeting glimpses or anything. Exactly. These are detailed descriptions. This massive triangular craft. I mean, some people were saying it was as big as a football field just hovering in the sky. And that's the thing about this case. It's that the sheer duration of the sighting is really unusual. This wasn't a flash in the pan. We're talking about people who observed this object for hours in some cases, giving them a lot of time to study its features, its movements, trying to make sense of it all. And it wasn't just a single triangle either. Right. Some reports mention multiple lights, all moving in formation around this, like a larger, darker shape. Yeah, and that's where those uh, those size estimates really come into play. Okay. If you have multiple points of light all converging around a central point, you can create this illusion of vastness. Okay, see, this is what I'm talking about. This is what gets me going with this stuff. Like, it's one thing if it were just a few, you know, folks out, like, stargazing or something. But we're talking about, like, police officers on duty. Trained observers. Exactly. Reporting the same thing from different locations. You know, that fact that law enforcement officers, individuals who were trained to be observant, to be skeptical, that they were among the eyewitnesses, it does lend a certain level of credibility to the case. Yeah. Their training, it makes it less likely that they would misinterpret a mundane object or some kind of atmospheric phenomenon. You know? For sure. And it gets even more interesting because your research highlighted some pretty compelling firsthand accounts from these officers. Mm -hmm. Apparently, it wasn't just what they were seeing. Like, their equipment started acting up, too. Oh, really? Yeah. One officer, he described his patrol car radio going completely haywire, crackling with static. And this was all while the object was in view. But as soon as it disappeared, the interference stopped. Wow. That detail about electronic malfunctions, you know, it's not unique to this case. It's actually something that we see pop up again and again in UFO reports. Now, while skeptics, of course, they might just attribute this to coincidence or just simple equipment malfunction, some researchers believe it could be linked to, like, electromagnetic fields. Like, there's this theory that UFOs, if they exist they might emit these strong electromagnetic pulses that could mm -hmm. interfere with electronic devices. And it wasn't like this was happening in some remote, you know, backwoods area or something. Yeah. This was right near Scott Air Force Base. Oh, I see where you're going with this. Yeah, which if you're into like UFOs and conspiracies and stuff, you know, that's like major red flag territory. Right, it's like straight out of the X-Files. You know, you've got this major military installation, reports mm. of strange lights in the sky, people talking about equipment malfunctions. Yeah. I mean, it's a recipe for intrigue, for sure. Exactly. And you actually, you found some declassified documents, right, related to how the Air Force responded to this. Oh, yeah. I dug into that. Yeah. It was pretty clear that they were definitely paying attention. So what was their take? Did they have any explanations? Well, the FAA got called in. There were multiple investigations launched. They were trying to figure out what was going on up there. Okay, but here's the thing that always gets people, this is what gets the conspiracy theories really spinning. What's that? They never actually explained it. Officially, the 1997 Illinois UFO sighting remains just that, unidentified. Which, of course, you know, that just adds fuel to the fire. But it's important to remember that unidentified does not automatically equal extraterrestrial. Right, right. It doesn't automatically mean little green men, but it does leave it open, right? right? And you do a good job of presenting some of the alternative explanations. Well, I try to be as thorough as possible. You have to look at all the angles. Exactly. So let's do that. What are some of the explanations that have been proposed over the years? Well, the most common skeptical explanation is misidentification. Some people have said it might have been a type of weather balloon, you know, called a skyhook balloon. 
These things can actually resemble a triangular shape from certain angles, and they're often used for atmospheric research and stuff. Okay, so kind of a case of mistaken identity. Plausible. But then how do we explain all those people, those police officers, all those detailed descriptions? Right, and your research actually brought up a good point about that. These skyhook balloons, they usually have a very different light signature than what was described. And they're typically deployed at much higher altitudes than what was being reported in this case. Okay, so we can maybe rule out the weather balloon theory. What about, like, a secret military project? I mm -hmm. mean, Area 51, experimental aircraft, you know, that kind of thing. Is there anything to that? Well... It's a popular theory for sure, and it's definitely true that military technology is often shrouded in secrecy. Some have speculated that maybe, just maybe, it could have been some kind of prototype stealth aircraft being tested, <laughs> you know, with Scott Air Force Base being right there. The triangular shape and silent flight would fit the profile. It would. But the problem is the prolonged visibility and that sheer size that those witnesses were describing that makes it a little less likely. Okay, so we've got some plausible explanations, even if they're not, like, entirely convincing. But I think we need to address the elephant in the room here, or should I say the spaceship in the sky. Trickles. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. So aliens, we have to at least touch on that. And some of the details, I have to admit, they're pretty intriguing. It's true. There are some aspects of this case that really do lend themselves to that kind of speculation. The triangular shape, silent hovering the reports of electromagnetic interference. I mean, these are all elements that frequently pop up in UFO lore. They're practically staples of science fiction at this point. For sure, and I feel like for someone who's maybe on the fence about this whole UFO thing, seeing a case like this with its credible witnesses and, you know, official investigations that don't really lead anywhere, has to at least make you wonder, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it really challenges our understanding of what's possible. It's a good reminder that there are still mysteries out there in this universe that we just haven't solved. But, you know, even if we entertain that possibility, the possibility of extraterrestrial involvement, we have to do it with a critical eye. We can't just jump to conclusions. It reminds me of that line, you know, I want to believe. But belief, that's not really what we're after here, is it? No, not at all. It's about the evidence and looking at everything from all these different angles, acknowledging that sometimes there just aren't any easy answers. Yeah, and that's what I think makes this stuff so fascinating. Regardless of what you believe about this sighting, about UFOs in general, it forces us to confront some really big questions, doesn't it? Okay, so besides are we alone, what else do you think a case like this makes us think about? Well, I think it highlights the limits of our own perception. You know, we like to think that we've got this world pretty much figured out, that we understand how things work. And then something like this comes along. And just throws everything we thought we knew out the window. And you actually found some really insightful stuff from witnesses, you know, talking about how this experience, it wasn't just about the object itself. It really did change their whole outlook, you know, on life, the universe, everything. Absolutely. That's incredibly common in these kinds of encounters. And it makes me think about this concept psychologists call cosmic loneliness. Cosmic loneliness. What's that? It's this feeling of being so incredibly small, so insignificant when you're confronted with something so vast and unknown. Which is interesting when you think about it, right? Because here we are having these conversations, looking for answers, exploring all these possibilities. It's like this very human need to understand the universe and our place in it. I agree. Whether or not we actually find those answers, you know, that act of searching, of questioning what's out there, that's what propels us forward. That's a great point. Well, we're coming up on the end of our deep dive here, but before we go, I've got to ask, for you personally, what's your takeaway from all of this? If someone were to ask you point blank, what do you think really happened that night in Illinois? What would you say? Honestly, I'd have to say that the most important thing isn't necessarily finding a definitive answer. It's about embracing the mystery of it all. It's about acknowledging that there are still things out there that we don't understand, and that's okay. Because it's that sense of wonder, that willingness to keep an open mind, that keeps us exploring, learning, pushing the boundaries of what we think we know. It keeps us connected to something so much bigger than ourselves. Well said. And then to everyone listening, what do you think? Does this story, this sighting, make you a believer? Are you a skeptic? Mm -hmm. Or are you somewhere in between? Whatever your conclusion, let it be fuel for your curiosity. Keep exploring, keep asking questions, and never lose that sense of awe and wonder about the world around us.